Hello. I'm glad you're able to listen to this message. If you're not involved in a church somewhere, we'd love for you to join us some Sunday at Hope Fellowship for one of our three services. If not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area that teaches God's Word. I hope you enjoy the message. Ready for all the rain this week? <laughs> kind of. Lord, we do thank you for this, this morning. We're grateful that we can know you. We're, we're grateful for this place that we can meet. The short time that we get to spend with you. Father, we're, we're mindful uh, everywhere we drive as we raise our eyes that you're the one who, who made all that we see even as we look up into the night and into the, into the sky during the day, we understand that the uh, vast expanse of space, you're greater than it all. And outside of time and space, we come to you as the one who made us. And we're glad that you have loved us, have been mindful of us, that you care for us deeply enough to do something, to bring us to yourself, to step into human history and to purchase us for yourself. Jesus, thank you for doing that. We're grateful that you have uh, taken our place in judgment and demonstrated your great power by rising from the dead, conquering death. We look forward to seeing you one of these days. We can't wait to see you. In the Spirit of God, we're grateful that you are the one who lives in us and among us as believers. You're the one who does your work. Uh, you're the one who has inspired truth for us to, to read and to trust you're the one who stirs in the hearts of people, creating questions and causing people to seek you and to find you. Lord, we understand these words that we read in the Bible are, are yours and they're inspired by you. Well, we ask that you would teach us as we take a closer look at some of them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you... Uh, might be aware of the pastor that had a deacon in his church that eh, from time to time was known to cuss. People were reporting it, you know, when he'd get frustrated, he would blurt out a word, you know, and, and the pastor knew he probably had to have a talk with him about his language, about how he handled himself that way. And so he thought, you know, I'm going to take him fishing and uh, got him out in the boat for a period of time, hoping to have a conversation with him about how he used his mouth and frustrating moments and um, man the pastor hooked a fish that I was bending his pole in half almost and he's he's uh, totally excited he's reeling that thing in the, the deacon gets the net out and he's about ready to get the fish comes right up to the side of the boat snap line broke the pastor's staring down into the water angry look on his face deacon staring down there and the pastor turned to the deacon and says sir I believe something needs to be said right now <laughs> the question I have is are you a are you a growing believer this is a this is a message that's a standalone from my series in Ephesians uh, just a special time to kick the fall off and uh, we're going to talk about growth habits today and when I ask you this uh, about growing spiritually some of you might be neutral on the subject, not too excited about it, maybe even wondering what it's all about, possibly. Um, and so I'm going to make some prelim preliminary comments before I wade, wade into the body of what I'm going to say. And the first one is this, spiritual growth requires a meaningful vision for your life. If you're going to grow spiritually, you have to know what life is about. I mean... Someone isn't going to grow spiritually unless they have an overarching vision of God for their life. If you haven't figured out why you're alive yet, you're just not going to grow the way God wants you to. You just won't. 
And you hear phrases all around you. Maybe people repeat to you. Maybe the seminars that you've been to and people, you know, type out their philosophy of life sometimes and try to influence us with, you know, like uh, go for your dreams, reach for the stars. You hear a lot of this stuff at high school graduation as young people supposedly should be launched out into life with a grand vision of how they should live. Reach for the stars, go for your dreams, uh, you know, be all you can be. What is the overarching reason for your existence? Why are you alive? Why should you live? Unless that issue is settled, you're not going to grow spiritually. And, uh, you know, we only need to uh, lean on Solomon for some either real depressing news or some real encouraging news when he examines life from his perspective in Ecclesiastes and, and, and says, listen, I've been there. I'm the richest guy in the world. I'm the most powerful man around. I'm the most influential guy. I've, I've, I've achieved things that, that people in this world have not achieved. And I'm going to tell you, it's empty. And that's what he said in, in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 1 and 2. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And he goes on for 11 to 12 chapters proving that any experience you have on this earth will leave you empty because it has to do with this world. And then he concludes. If you remember his conclusion in chapter 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In other words, if, 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 if the bottom line is if you leave God out of your life, you have no meaning. You have no purpose. You have no reason to live. And there's many believers that live in that space. They haven't said, you are the reason for my existence, you see. And therefore, they're not growing spiritually. They're not growing the way God wants them to. See, in Mark chapter 1, verse 16, we find uh, Jesus, uh, uh, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. That was their business. That might have been their life dream. That might have been passed on from, from their father. This was what it was all about, you see. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once... They left their nets and followed him. Let me ask you a question. What is the most significant thing you could possibly do on the face of this planet? Possibly do while you're on this planet. Follow Jesus and learn to fish. <laughs> you fishermen are going, yeah. <laughs> I knew I was on the right track, you know. But this was something they threw everything aside for. You see what happened in the passage. They left their nets and they followed him. He calls us to leave our nets. Not that we don't need to supply a living for our family, supply a living for ourselves, have something that we can help other people with as we go about our work. But we don't see that as the single most important thing that we would ever do on the planet. And many of the other uh, preoccupations we can be involved in. See, in John 17, 3, Jesus said, now this is eternal life. You want to know what life is about? You want to know what living is? What does he say? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God, and you don't have life. See? In John 10, 10, he says, I have come that they might have life and might have it abundantly, overflowing the cup. You see? The life God gives is not boring and insignificant and should be set aside for everything else that we think is reaching for the stars and going for our dreams. It should be drawn right in front of us and that this is life. And when that happens, you will grow. You will grow. And uh, Philippians 1.21, the Apostle Paul said something that should be everyone's mission statement or statement of purpose in life. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It doesn't get much simpler than that. But here's a man who set aside everything. As he says in Philippians 3, 7, look what he says. But whatever is to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He had a lot going for him, but he said, I'm pushing that to the side. Because I've met the true and living God and it's all about him. See, it's all about him. You will never grow if you don't have an overarching purpose of life and a reason for your existence that isn't the living God himself front and center in your life. You just won't grow. Or you'll have confusing thoughts about what that means. You know, he's asking me to do something, and I don't feel like doing it, but I'm going to do it for him. 
meaning a spiritual leader or somebody else. Second thing I want to say is that growth requires a level of discipline. Growth requires a level of discipline. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with the godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Wow. Sometimes believers think, it just happens, man. You know, I put my faith in Christ and... I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the growth. I'm waiting for some kind of a change. What does he say? Discipline yourself. Train yourself to be godly. He doesn't say work hard so that you'll be a Christian. He said, you want to be a godly person? You want to incorporate all the values of God and then live them out in this world so that you can influence other people? It's going to take some effort on your part. And look what he says. He says, for physical training is of some value, and he loved athletic illustrations, especially those of running. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Yeah, you can discipline yourself to be a great Olympic uh, uh, athlete, and it's going to take some work. It's going to take some commitment, sacrifice. You need to push other things aside in order to push that in front of you so that you can succeed at it. He's saying that has some value. And even though everyone else around you is going, that is so cool. Wouldn't it be awesome to be that? That's reaching for the dreams. That's reaching for the stars, man. That's not what Paul's saying. It has some value. But godliness has value for all things. See? Holding promise for not just this life. It encompasses your life now. And takes you on through eternity. See, And so... There are certain things that you can focus on while, while you live these short 80 years of life, and some of you might even make it to 100. Yahoo! Right? But it's going to happen. And that, by the way, is one of the most frustrating things Solomon said that you can happen in this life, is that you work hard at everything you do, and then you die. And you got to leave everything to some person behind you somewhere. Look what Paul said uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He even teases this out further. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners won, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. He's not talking about earning eternal life. He's talking about being a person of influence in this life. Someone who God uses. Someone who God changes. Someone who's able to speak into other people's lives with great authority and power. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. Who does that? Well, that's not training. And many people live their spiritual lives that way. And they see no focus to their life, so their discipline in, in the spiritual area is all out of whack because they don't even understand the purpose for it. Why should I discipline myself? I got other things I really care about, you see. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What is that prize? Being used by God in this life to influence other people. And he speaks of that in 1 Thessalonians 2, where he talks about them being his glory, his crown. See? Let me read this to you. I found this quote. This was interesting. Um, came from a man by the name of Robert Morgan. He said, the word practice implies we must go to work developing certain skills until they become habitual or proficient like an athlete or a musician. These are the Bible's perpetual habits for a gradual and glorious experience with the God of peace. He's talking about habits, disciplines in our life that bring us to a place that God will change us and use us more. And he, he quotes someone who's not even a believer, but the principle is a pretty good one. And he says, in her book, Better Than Before, what I learned about making and breaking habits, Gretchen Rubin calls habits, here it is, this is a great line, the invisible architecture of daily life. We repeat about 40% of our behavior almost daily. So listen to this. He said, so our habits shape our existence and our future. Do you not find that to be true in your life in many different areas? 
What you develop as habits in your life will shape your existence and your future. See? And, you know, sometimes believers think in similar terms with God. They just run on autopilot with a lot of bad habits that they've always had. Not really being challenged to change, not disciplining themselves to be different. And they continue on in the same track they're on. And they go, why isn't God changing me? Well, he saved you, but you're not changing because you're not working. You're not making decisions. You're not applying yourself, you see. In a lot of ways, that that's, that's the case. And the third thing, by preliminary comments, I want to say here is, your acceptance by God does not depend on your effort. And this is key. Because when the Apostle Paul talks about discipline and things that we need to do in the Scriptures, he's not talking about things that we need to be climbing a ladder to earn God's favor so that he'll accept us and, and save us for all of eternity. That's not what he's talking about in many cases. Your influence is a person on this earth. But your acceptance by God does not depend on your effort. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Especially if you're not a believer here today. For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. And so, here we are, unrighteous people. We haven't done anything to please God. We've done nothing but live the way that we feel like living and define what's right by our own feelings. That's how most people live their life. And... You know, we find lists of sin in the scripture, uh, this and that, and the other thing are sin, but it all is burped out of an attitude of, I'm first, I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing, and I'm going to define my own morality for myself. And that's what people live their lives, unrighteously. But here's a perfect person, God himself, who added human flesh to his divine nature that said, they're never going to earn their way into heaven. And if something is going to happen to bring them into my presence, someone has to die instead of them to pay the price they owe for their sin. And Christ shows up, the God-man, and took our place in punishment so that we could be forgiven if we trust him. He rose from the dead, conquering death, conquering sin. And when we turn to him and say, I trust you, Lord, I can't do it on my own, he declares you right in his sight. That's called being justified. And you're one of his children. You see, it doesn't depend on your effort. It depends on you recognizing that you can't earn your way into heaven and you need what he's provided you, that lifeline that he threw down in Christ. You know, in Romans 8, 1, it's clearly said, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Uh, if you have put your faith in Christ, there's no condemnation for you. And in, in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9, what does it say? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. He's given you a gift to save you from an eternity apart from him, and all you have to do is trust him for it. And what's the rest of the verse say? And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, you see. No one can boast. And so we don't earn our salvation. Your acceptance by God does not depend on your effort. And I want to make that clear when we talk about discipline and habits. Because sometimes believers think, oh man, I'm not working hard enough and God's not going to accept me. That's not what habits that he calls us to and discipline in our lives have to do with right now. Okay. I love Josh McDowell uh, in, a, in a book that uh, he wrote with his son, Sean. He, t he talks about a time when Sean was 12 years old and he was on a baseball team. And Josh McDowell went up to the coach before the season started. He had a whole bunch of coupons for ice cream for the kids. And he said, coach, I want you to give these to the kids but I don't want you to give them until they lose their first game to celebrate it. The coach looked at him and said, what? He said, yeah, and I'll read you what he said. He said, I believe my son is created in the image of God and that he has infinite value, dignity, and worth. None of these things have anything to do with playing baseball. If he ever played, never played baseball an inning in his life, I would love and accept him just as much. And then he said, the coach looked at Josh and said, that's weird. But he said this, he said, one of the boys on the team came up to Josh and said, thanks a lot for the ice cream sundaes, Mr. McDowell. Wow. It doesn't matter to you if we win or not. You love us anyway. See, had its intended effect, at least on that young man. And that's exactly how God sees us once we put our faith in Christ. We're not going to be condemned. But he calls us to a wonderful life of influence. 
If we discipline ourselves and if we, if we form the habits he wants and grow the way that he calls us to. And so with those comments made, I want to I launch into what I call growth habits here today and just remind us all of some things that God uh, would have for us to develop his habits in our life. First one is this, involve yourself in conversation with God. If you haven't made a habit of this, it has to be a habit. There were two ladies who were talking over coffee one day, and, and um, one lady said, I'm concerned about my husband. He talks to himself all the time. And the other lady said, mine does too, but he, does, he doesn't know it. He actually thinks I'm listening. Okay, so, you know, have you ever noticed how quickly relationships dry up if there's no communication? Right? They dry up quick. You don't converse with someone over a while. It's like, oh, man, I got to catch up with you. And you learn things that you haven't in a period of time that you haven't caught up with them. And it's not like God is drying up because you're not spending time with him. You dry up. Sometimes we go through periods where we go, wait a minute. I feel empty, lost. I feel dry. Examine your communication with God. Do you actually communicate with him? Do you take time as a habit, and this is what I'm saying, of your life to spend time communicating with him? You know, he designed you for communication, and he gave you the tools for it. He gave you the ability to converse with him spirit to spirit in your heart. Through your mouth, he gave you his word so that he can communicate with you. His Holy Spirit lives in your life to, to help you understand some of those things and bring them home in a special way as you read and consider. He's given you all the tools for it. And where does, where does, where does this voice of God come from? Within you, sometimes believers, uh, believers will say, you know, I, I just wait until I feel it because then I know it's the Holy Spirit. Please don't do that. Seriously. Don't do that. You don't wait till you feel something thinking that it's the Holy Spirit. You go to God's word first because the Spirit of God was the one who inspired his word so that when you read it, it's his voice and when you're reading something that he really wants to bring home to your heart, it's in his word already, but he really helps you during that moment understand it and think about your own life in light of it, you see. And, you know, we never wait till we feel something, especially if it's a command in the Bible. We read, uh, let's just say, do not lie. We don't say, I'm waiting for God just to kind of work in my heart and give me that, that sense that he really wants me not to lie anymore. Man, I hear stuff like that sometimes about other things. No, you don't wait for God to give you a feeling that you should do something he said in his word. You do it. If the feeling comes, wonderful. But if it doesn't, you're doing exactly what he told you to do. See, You know, it sometimes say, well, how can God's word, the Bible, be, uh, be his, um, uh, his word when man was involved in the process? It's got the fingerprints of man on it. We know that anything that man gets a hold of uh, is, 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 is going to be corrupt somehow. And so that's how most people view the Bible, right? But I'd like you to consider it in light of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to remind you. Peter says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, the writings, you see, came about by the prophet's own interpretation. In other words, some dude wasn't sitting on the side of his bed going... Mm -hmm. Oh, I got it now. I really feel like I need to say this. Listen, if God's not involved in the process, that's emptiness. That's foolishness, you see. And there are some religions based on that nonsense, you see. But if God's involved in the process, here's what happened. The all-powerful God who can uh, do whatever he wants. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Willing men, willing men who wanted to, to trust him and wanted to communicate his word. But this word carried along uh, is the same word used in the book of Acts when it's talking about the apostle Paul being caught in a hurricane. You remember what happened? The hurricane force wind drove them along. And I'm sure all those guys on the boat were trying to steer it. But guess where they went? Exactly where that hurricane wind took them. In the direction it was blowing. And that's the same word used here. And the word for spirit and the word for wind in the New Testament in Greek language is exactly the same. 
And so the hurricane force of God's Holy Spirit, though these men were attempting to communicate and listen and hear what God was saying, made sure that what came out of their mouths and were written down was exactly what he wanted to say. So if you believe there's a powerful God who made this universe, you're going to believe that there's a powerful God, if he wanted to say something to us, did. And that's exactly what we have in front of us when we read the scriptures. And if you haven't been convinced of that yet, quite possibly you haven't read the Bible uh, at least once but I suggest start in the New Testament and just spend a year, a year and a half asking, is this really your word? And read it and see what happens. See? Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. What does it say about God's word? Let it dwell in you richly. What happens when something is planted in you that, that dwells there richly? It produces something in your behavior, in your mindset. And that's what needs to happen with God's word. His thoughts need to be planted in us. And, and the soil of our heart needs to be such that we receive it. And we allow something to grow out of it. Richly. Something to influence other people with. Something that would produce a, um, a different spirit and character in us. But his word, his voice is what does that. And we need to spend time listening to his voice, exposing ourselves to it. In Psalm 119, 105, one of the best uh, places you can turn is, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. You want to know how to live? You have to have God's word. Light in your path in front of you. No, I don't want you to go that direction, though many of your friends are going that direction, and they're doing those kind of things. No, uh, and I want you going there with them. Here, I want you right here. I don't want you straying off in that direction either where, where uh, the voices of uh, whoever on the radio is telling you this is okay and your television show is telling you that. No, I want you right here. What's going to tell you that? It's not going to be the evening news. It's not going to be your favorite television show. It's going to be God's word telling you where to go and how to live your life. You see? And so we have his voice. We're exposing ourselves to his voice, and, and we have a response. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. See, this is a conversation, and this is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but most powerful. Pray continually. Talk to him. Have a conversation with Tell him what's on your heart. Not so that it will change God, but what happens when you talk to him, and you tell him what's going on in your life, and you ask him for certain things, and you tell him how great he is in response to what you're seeing in his word. He changes you. You see? It's a conversation. In 1 Peter 4, 7, wonderful verse, the end of all things is near. Have you realized that yet, by the way? I mean, you think, well, I got 80 years to live. No. You've been to funerals before where someone in their 40s or 30s or 50s, done. And you know what? Jesus said, I'm coming back. We don't know when. That can be any minute. See? The end of all things is near. Therefore, you want to stay focused. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Discipline. Discipline. Conversation with God is a discipline in your life that must be there. You go, well, I'm not feeling it right now. No, we've just been told to pray. We've just been told that God's word should be seated in us, right? So take a special time during the day. I have to have a conversation with Leslie every day. Okay, now, I'm not the kind of guy that likes to talk a lot, okay? I'm really not. She is a wonderful gift in my life. And at some point, maybe in the, in the first 15 years of marriage, I turned a corner where I actually wanted to have a conversation with her all the time. At first, I was just in my own world not knowing how to say certain things. And she would help me a lot. She would express what's going on in her and what the day held, and, and I'm responding by nodding on my head and having that kind of a conversation with her. But now, these days, I can't, I can't not have a conversation with her. I have to know what's going on in her life. I have to know what's, uh, what, what, what's on the table for the week and all that kind of stuff, and we need daily contact for that. I can't go a day without talking to her. Listen, you need to be at the same place with God. You can't go a day without talking to him without having a conversation, without listening in on what he might have to say to you through his word. 
And the discipline involves this. When are you going to spend time doing that? You've got to take that time. You've got to make the time. That's discipline. It's going to be in the morning. It's going to be in the evening. It's going to be in my lunch break. Whenever it is, you've got to set that and live by it. You're going to open God's Word. You're going to read some of it. You're going to ask Him to teach you. And you're going to have a conversation with Him every single day. You might be just like me in the first few years of my marriage. Um, mm, I, but discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. It has to be there. It's a habit. If you're going to grow, it has to be there. Second, involve yourself in God's community. There was a there was a 200-year-old church that was going to celebrate uh, this wonderful anniversary that they had. And it was one of those churches with this high bell tower and all kinds of bells up there, and big ones. And, and the priest of this particular uh, church uh, uh, was just pulling his hair out because, because the, their head bell ringer uh, had to leave out of town and wasn't going to be there for the celebration. So he had to find some replacement guy. You know, the replacement guy came in, and, and he's trying to show him the ropes. He climbs up this huge platform, and, and uh, the guy's are just kind of exhausted getting up to the top, and he trips. And, man, his face just gets planted right in one, the biggest bell up there, and everyone around heard, boom. Well, that wasn't enough. It fell back, and, and he tumbled down the stairs and blap out on the street. Man, they rushed down there. What's going to happen to this guy? They called the ambulance. The ambulance came in and, and picked him up. One of the, the workers of the ambulance says, listen, anyone know this guy's name? Looked at the priest. What's his name? He says, man, I have no idea what his name is, but his, his face sure rings a bell. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you this question. Would you... <laughs> Would you rather have your face ring a bell? <laughs> or would you rather someone know your name? Okay. I think everyone in this room would rather someone know our name. Right? And, and, and anyone who wants to be a part of what God's doing and God's people wants someone to know their name. Okay. And so why, why should you be involved in God's community? Here's the best answer I can give you. Because you're already a part of it. You can't escape that. We've been learning that in Ephesians in that series we've been going through. You can't escape it. You're already a part of his community because that's what it means to be a child of God who possesses the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit possesses and who has united you with Christ. You're united with each other if you're a believer here today. In John 14, 20, one of the most profound things that Jesus has said that uh, settles on my heart every time I read it, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father and that I, I, you are in me and that I am in you. There's this wonderful union that it means for you to have life. You are united with God forever through Christ. And guess what? On that day you're going to realize how profound that connection is. You know what else happened as a result of it? You were united with each other. Whether you like it or not. And whether you like other people or not. Who are believers. Look at Romans chapter 12 verse 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ. We who are many. Form one body. And each member. Listen to the strong this language is belongs to the others. Belongs. You see? Man, there's no Lone Ranger believers out there going, hey, I'm living my life on my own. I don't care about those people. You belong to them. We belong to each other. You see, that's the bottom line for fellowship. That's the bottom line. Why should we involve ourselves with God's community? Because he made you a part of his community if you're a believer in Jesus. He took you from being dead, made you alive. He took you from being a sinner, made you a saint. He calls you one of his children. He possesses you with his Holy Spirit. A seal, a, a, a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. Listen, he purchased you and made you a part of each other's lives in my life. So here's the vision that we need to have for church. 
In Acts 20, 20, the apostle Paul said something interesting. He said, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you as he's about ready to leave these elders. He said this, would have taught you publicly and from house to house. You want to ask what Paul's strategy for ministry was? There it was. Large group meetings and small group fellowship. That's the way it was. And some, I've heard it called 2020 vision in the past. 2020 vision. Large group, small group. Why the small group in the homes? So someone can know your name. Right? You know, in a church of 100 or more, you're not going to find that. Easy. You see, there's, there's going to be, you're going you're gonna to get to know some people, depending on how the church is. Some people might know you by name, but if you, you need to have a vision for two different meeting times every week. The worship time, this time, and a lot of believers don't even have that vision. This is the most basic one. See, you want to form a habit in your life that's going to change you, that God wants to use to develop you, to grow you? This is one of them. It has just got to be. Weekly time of worship that he calls the church the called out assembly. And so we do that. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Even in that day, he identified it as a habit people have. Why? Because we're, we have other things that we think are more important. If we're self-directed people who have put our faith in Jesus and we're learning to be more Christ-centered in our life, of course, it's going to be a struggle for people to have other things that they think are more important. They keep them away, see. Keep them away. He says, and all the more, let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I don't think there's ever a time that someone walks away from an assembly of believers and says, boy, that was a total waste if you're a believer in Christ. At least you're going to see someone else there and you're going to go, they think this is important too. There's a true and living God and Jesus is coming back. You see? But let us encourage him one as all the more as you see that day approaching. The second thing uh, I believe this involves is regular small group involvement. You need to get involved in a smaller group within a church. Now look how the first church even, even operated in Acts chapter 2 verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common, man. They, they were like, hey, we're in this together. See, selling their possessions and goods they gave to one another as they had a need. Their resources, their money. You know, listen, let me help you. You got a problem? We're in this together. We're followers of Christ. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I'm not asking you to do that. Every day. Okay. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Large group, small group. They ate together, shared their lives together in those smaller group settings where each of them learned each other's names, right? Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So he does his work when people know each other's names and they enjoy the relationship they have with God together with him front and center. You see? The best evangelism that any church can ever do is be the body of Jesus. That's the best evangelism. Be the body of Jesus. Okay? Uh, listen to this. A pastor wrote, he says, I was a supply preacher for a small town in a Texas church. Coming in early Sunday, preaching a sermon to the congregation, and then leaving after lunch. Arriving early one Sunday, I sat down at a local donut shop, opened my Bible, and went over my sermon notes. A man was sitting down at the counter, across the counter from me and said, You a preacher or something? I replied, Yes, I, I teach at the Christian church here in town. He got excited and said, Hey, I'm a member of that church. Well, the church was small, and I knew all of the regulars, so I said, uh, Man, I've been teaching there for about three months, and I've never seen you there. He looked at me kind of strange and said, I said I was a member of that church. I never said that I was fanatical about it. Man, you got to be fanatical about it. You absolutely have to be fanatical about it. You want to grow? You want to be everything God wants you to be on this earth? This is absolutely something he calls you to. Spend time with him in conversation and spend time with a community of believers. It is absolutely something he calls you to. It's not something you need to feel. I don't feel the spirit leading me to be there. 
uh, on a regular basis because I got this other commitment. That's not something you need to feel. That's something you're told to do. That God has designed for a reason in your life. See? You got to be fanatical about it. Uh, two reasons you need to be involved. One, for yourself. But here's the one, this is the rub for a lot of people who think they've grown enough, and sometimes people kind of get prideful and arrogant in this way. Ah, you know, I know all that stuff, and I don't need to be there on a regular basis. I'm pretty strong. I can handle it. And I'm, I'll be out of town here. I'll be over there, there, and then I'll be here, there. I'll, be, I'll make church once a month. That'd be cool. This one's not about you at this point. There's a page that you turn where God says it's about others. You need to be there for them. You see, not just yourself. And the statistic is this, and it still holds. Unless someone knows the names of seven people, the names of seven people, not just faces that ring a bell, the names of seven people within six months, they won't be in, continue to be involved in a church. That's a, a statistic that has been studied and researched. It's just going to happen. You know that. Some of you might be ticking down on your fifth month, and you're going, I don't know anyone there. I don't know anyone there. And why should we even keep going? And sometimes people are in the category of they can't afford not to. You see? Well, that means that other believers in some way need to be reaching out, connecting, or that there needs to be a little bit boldness in your life to say, I need to get connected. I need to step forward. I need to get involved. I want to grow. I, don't, I need to learn someone's name, and I, need, I just need to get a little bit of boldness in my life and be around them, you see? I remember, just to remind you, if you've heard this before, about my mom when I was at church. As a kid, she took me periodically to church. And we were in a congregation that was maybe a smaller, a little bit smaller gathering than this. And uh, I'm there with her as a teenager. And she stands up in the middle of the service and just cries out. I can't take this anymore. And she starts crying. I mean, just stands up. I mean, could you imagine the desperation that someone would reach when they, when they come to that point? I can't take this anymore. And she says, I, I, and several other things, but I was so horrified, I can't even remember how this was. <gasps> <laughs> oh, you know, everyone was sitting down. She was, and, uh, and, you know, thank God for people who know how to love and surround. And they came, they grabbed her and, and uh, separated her and prayed with her and, and tried to encourage her and get her some direction. But who, why would someone come to a place like that? Because they didn't know the names of anybody. That's why. Nobody. And that's not what community is about. It's about small groups. You need to be involved in other people's lives. Whether you think you need it. Or because there's someone else that needs to learn a name or two. You see. Someone else. Okay. Third growth habit and final one I'll talk about. Involve yourself in God's service. Involve yourself in God's service. You know there's a, a man and his wife who were awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. And some dude was knocking on their door. It was raining outside. And so the husband comes down cautiously, looks through the door. The guy's obviously been drinking a little bit, according to his observation. And he cracks the door and says, yeah, what do you want? The man uh, uh, out there said, hey, hey, can you give me a push? You know, in the, in the guy's mind, he's going, oh, this guy got himself in a situation because he's been drinking. He shouldn't be out at night like this, driving around. This is his fault. I'm not going out there and pushing him. And so he goes upstairs. He said, no, he goes upstairs. And his wife said, who is that? And he says, it's some guy that wanted to push. He's drunk. And, uh, and his wife says, shame on you. She said, uh, uh, there, remember that time uh, two or three months ago when our car broke down and it was raining and someone gave us a push? Remember how we appreciated it? Okay. So he goes downstairs and he cracks the door open and he says, he says, hey, you still there? The guy from the dark says, yeah. He says, uh, you still need a push? He says, yeah, I'd love one. He says, well, where are you? He said, I'm over here on the swing waiting for a push. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you this. Are you involved in humble service? Are you involved in humble service? And let me define that for you. Let me define humble service for you. And I say humble service is when you lower yourself. Okay, that's humility. When you lower yourself to do a thankless job. A thankless job to advance God's work. That's humble service. 
Are you involved in that? Now, I'm not saying, man, I'm feeling good about what I'm doing, or I'm waiting for something that really fits me. I'm asking, are you involved in humble service? Where you lower yourself on a regular basis to do a thankless job to advance God's kingdom. And I'm going to say this, you will not grow unless you experience that. Unless you do that. Personally, it helps you grow. And it helps other people grow. Okay? I mean, you need to go no further than to read John chapter 13. And for me to remind you of it right now, I'm going to do that. In verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast. And Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So he knew who he was. He knew he came from the Father and he's going to part of this world for a while as he would be crucified, put in a grave, he would rise from the dead, and then he would ascend into heaven, return to the Father. And he's going to show them the full extent of his love. Now in verse 2, the evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. This is important in this story. In verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew who he was. He didn't have anything to lose. He was going to lose anything by the act that followed this. And unless you know who you are, you're not going to be involved in humble service. Because you receive everything you need from the true and living God who made you one of his children. You will lose nothing when you involve yourself in humble service. In verse 4, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Listen, you're not going to get much lower than that in humble service. And their time. That was the job of a slave or a servant at the door, if you recall. Anyone who would come into a banquet or come into a meeting with road dust on their feet, they would always have a servant at the door to wash the filth off of their feet so that they can enter and enjoy the experience. And that slave would do the scrubbing. Evidently, they came into the room and there was no slave there, so no one was going to do that job. No one was going to stoop down and do that number. And so Jesus ordained in this whole experience for them and understood what was going to happen next. What did he do? He dressed himself like a slave. And he knelt down. Look at, look at what it says here. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Like, hey, that's not a job for the master. It's not a job for some of your status. See? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now notice what he's doing. He's not only referring to the humble act that he was doing then, but he was also pointing down to this humble act where he would lower himself as the living God adding human flesh to his divine nature and then going to a place of a humiliating death instead of us to scrub our filthy souls. An act of humble service. But here's an act of humble service that he's doing. Jesus answered, <laughs> Lord, Simon Peter answered, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. And Jesus said, a person who's had a bath Needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. Uh, listen, I'm not going to give you a bath, Peter. Okay, I'm just, I'm just going to wash your feet. All right, that's all I'm going to do here. Uh, when, and, 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 and you are clean, though not every one of you. Remember Judas? Whose feet did he wash? Every single one of their feet, including the one he knew would betray him. You talk about humble service. You see. And... And he said, for he knew he was going to betray him. And that's why it said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Act of humble service. You see. Act of hum humble service. 
And I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You want to grow? Involve yourself in that habit. Lowering yourself is an act of humility and involve yourself in a thankless job to advance God's work. Now, you may not wash someone's feet, but how about wiping a butt in the nursery? There's an act of humble service, very humble service. And when you choose to, to serve, it, it, it changes your mindset. It changes you in some profound way as you serve God in an act of humble service. Um, and, and sometimes people serve thinking, eh, they owe me for this. And if you got that mindset, you're not involving yourself in humble service. You've just redefined what you're doing. You know, at least someone could say thanks. Well, someone may. Someone may. But it's not necessary for humble service. Because you're not serving somebody else. I remember a guy in, in Los Angeles when I was on staff at a church in California as a young adults guy. The, uh, uh, one of my buddies there uh, was telling me a story about his dad. And he said, I hated my dad for the first eight to ten years of my life for this. He said uh, he would get me up before the sun came up on Saturday mornings. And he would haul me up to the church and he would start doing all kinds of yard work around the church while it was still dark and he'd make me help him. He said, I got so frustrated once, I respected my dad, I loved him. He said, but I, I finally just said to him one time, he said, Dad, I don't like getting up before the sun's up. And he says, why do we do this anyhow? Why do we get up before the sun comes up? No one can see us anyhow. And he said, he'll never forget, his dad just stopped working for a moment, dead silent, walked over, kneeled in front of me, and I didn't know what he was going to do. But he grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, he said, son, that's exactly why we get up before the sun comes up, so no one can see us. You see? see, that's what humble service is. You don't care who sees you. You have lowered yourself just like your master lowered himself. And you're doing a task that you want no thanks for on this earth. That's what service is. That's what humble service is. And so, uh, uh, you know, let me, let me just close with this. I'm gonna, I, I found this in a, in, a, in a book from John Maxwell called The Complete 101 Collection. And he muses about a lot of different things regarding leadership there. He's a pastor for a long time and, and he ta t has taught on leadership for a while. And he says, people can change. And that's the greatest motivation of all. Nothing sparks the fires of desire more than the sudden realization that you do not have to stay the same. You want to grow? Fall in love with the challenge of change and watch the desire to change grow. And that's what happened to, listen to this, Aleda Hussein, 78 years old, of Rotterdam, Netherlands. She'd been a smoker for 50 years, and for 50 years she tried to give up the habit. But she was unsuccessful. Some of you might know what that feels like. It's a tough one to break from what I hear. And uh, for, for 50 years, she just, I'm, I can't change. And so then Leo Jensen, 79, proposed marriage and refused to go through with the wedding until Aleda gave up smoking. Guess what happened? Suddenly, there was the ability to stop smoking. Suddenly, suddenly a decision was made that impacted her life and his life. Miraculously. But what was the motivation for it? Pure love for that man. She couldn't imagine living without him. And he said, I'm not going to do this unless you stop. And so she quit. And he goes on. And he says, my life is dedicated to helping others reach their potential I suggest that you follow the advice of Mark Twain, and he quotes this guy. Take your mind out every now and then and dance on it. It is getting all caked up. It was his way of saying, get out of that rut. Too many times we settle into a set way of thinking and accept limitations that need not be placed upon us. Embrace change and it will change you. What he's saying is, you want discipline in your life? You want to grow? You want to be everything God wants you to be? It's going to involve some discipline, some habits to change. 
And if you love the living God who saved you and is bringing you to an eternity with him and you want to be everything he wants you to be, it should motivate you to be everything he wants you to be. Those habits involve yourself in conversation with God, involve yourself with God's community, and involve yourself in humble service should always be in place. Uh, that's why Jeff is here as a connections pastor. There's plenty of small groups that have been started up. Some great leaders in the church are going. You have time. You have a Bible. You spend that time on a regular basis and find a place to serve. If you haven't found a place to serve here, do that. There's plenty of needs, especially in the children's ministry, by the way. A wonderful area where you can influence even the youngest among us. Wonderful area. Humble service. And so, Lord, we come to you. And we're grateful that we can know you. We're grateful that we can put our confidence in you and find life in you. A new meaning, a new purpose for living because we know you. Thank you. Thank you that you're the one who calls us to, to a life of discipline so that we can be everything that you want us to be while we live this life. And bring you glory in the process. Bring honor to you and influence others in your name. I ask that each one of us in this room would have uh, the hearts uh, that are receptive to being everything that you want us to be. I pray for every believer here who is, man, they rolled their sleeves up, they're spending time with you, they're, they find you to be the center of their life. I ask that you would continue to encourage them, motivate them, refresh them. And Father, if there's any believers here who need to examine their priorities and adjust themselves in any way. Maybe you've pointed something out to them today. Oh, Lord, encourage them continually to be those kind of people that you call them to be. I ask that you wouldn't uh, uh, let that uh, pressure off of them so that they would grow, speak to them through your spirit at every turn. And, Father, I ask for anyone here who may not know you today, may not have ever entered that real relationship with you and, and find life eternal life in our relationship with you. I ask that they would make that decision and choose to trust what you've done to save them. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment, your eyes closed. Maybe you're here today just for a moment of prayer uh, as we spend at the end of this service. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand or anything, but if you're a believer here and you love him and you're serving him, just tell him what you appreciate about him for a moment. If you're a believer and you've been touched by uh, something that God may want you to do or to change, oh, embrace that and speak to him about that for just a moment, even if it's only a sentence. And if you don't know him and you want to, and maybe you're looking for words that you might say to him, I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And if you agree with these words, there's nothing wrong with you using them for yourself. And so, Lord, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for taking my place and being punished instead of me. I've done a lot of things that you hate. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus, amen.